Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Michael Telercio. I'm the pastoral intern here at Forest Hill Presbyterian Church, and you are joining us for day 334 of our daily walk through the scriptures with Jesus, one chapter per day. We have before us Judges chapter 4 today. We're going to need the Lord's help as we look at his word. Please pray with me. Father, this is a weighty passage. It is a challenging passage. It's a passage we need, just as all of your scriptures are. Thank you that you've provided it to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would work in us, that you would point us to your Son through this text, that we would see how we need him, that you would help us individually and personally see our need for your Son through this morning's chapter of Scripture. Please, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Judges chapter 4. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Agoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for twenty years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, and Kedish Naphtali, and said to him, from Kedish Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking ten thousand from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. And ten thousand men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zaananim, which is near Kedesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, nine hundred chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Harosheth Agoyim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with ten thousand men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harosheth Agoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for, she, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the, into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say, No. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Now, to understand this passage, we need to go back. We need to go back to the beginning of the Bible, in fact, when God created Adam and Eve. God created Adam from the dust of the ground, and then he created Eve from Adam's side, from his rib. 
And Adam was charged by God to, alongside Eve, take dominion over all of creation. And Adam was the head of the woman. He's the one who named his wife, and he's the one who was meant to protect and guard his wife. And that's why when Adam sins in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, it is his fault that the world is plunged into sin. God makes that clear in Romans chapter 5 through the Apostle Paul. Through one man, death came into the world. Sin and death came into the world through Adam. Not through Eve, through Adam. It was Adam's fault that sin entered the world. It was Adam's fault that Eve and Adam ate from the tree. And we see that hinted at in Genesis 3.6 when it says that Eve gave some of the fruit to Adam who was with her and he ate. And then, as if that's not clear enough, God then says in chapter 3 verse 17 of Genesis that it was because Adam listened to the voice of his wife and ate from the tree, the fruit of the tree that God had told him not to eat. That's why he had, that's why God pronounced a curse on creation. That's why there was this problem of sin that would go forth into the seed of Adam, into the world, into every human being born of ordinary generation, as the, as the um, Westminster Confession would put it. Everybody born of Adam's seed would be under Adam's sin. Now, with that as a backdrop, knowing that Adam was at fault, not only for eating the fruit, but for eating the fruit as a result of not leading his wife and lovingly protecting her and guarding her and guarding the garden from this intruder serpent that spread these lies. Knowing that context, we jump ahead. We saw this cycle begin in the book of Judges where in chapter 2, verse 11, down to the end of the chapter, God, through the author of the book of Judges, helps us see that there's this cycle that plays out over and over again in the book of Judges, where the people of Israel worship the false gods of the people that are in the land of Canaan. Because remember, the people of Israel failed to trust God, failed to drive out the Canaanites, uh, failed to drive out the people living in the land, and God left them there amongst his people in order to test them. We remember this from J Judges chapter 2, chapter 3. And in Judges 2, 11 to the end of the chapter, we see this clear cycle where the people begin by worshiping this false god or these false gods, and it leads them to be oppressed by the people in Israel and their circumstances become really low and then they cry out to God who is gracious and sends a judge and he delivers his people Israel and then the land has rest for some period of time and then after that judge dies the people again worship false gods and then they cry out to the Lord because they're being oppressed and the Lord delivers them with it and this cycle continues over and over again throughout the book of Judges. But what I want to mention here, the reason I'm pointing this out, is because that cycle doesn't just do this. That cycle does this throughout the book of Judges. If you're watching on the screen, you can see that my hand is moving downward in that spirally uh, shape there. Because things get worse and worse. Even as that cycle is playing out, things are getting worse and worse in the land of Israel, such that by the end of the book, things are awful. We get some of the most harrowing chapters of Scripture in all of the Bible in, in the end of Judges, by the, by the time we get to not only Samson, but those accounts even afterward. Things are a giant mess in the land of Israel. And that's setting us up to see the people's need for a king. That's why one of the themes uh, that appears toward the end of the book of Judges is that there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They need a true king who will rule over them. The judges aren't cutting it. And in fact, it's partly the judges' fault that things get worse and worse over time. Because while things started out great in Judges 3 with these three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, who, who did a great job rescuing people from Israel under the Lord's lead, things start to get worse over time, even amongst the judges, beginning in today's account with Barak. Now, we first see a problem with Barak, hinted at, in chapter 4, verse 6 of Judges. Deborah, this woman who is a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, who is judging Israel at that time, 
I wonder why she's judging Israel at that time. Verse 6, she sends and summons Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kedesh Naphtali, and says to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Hasn't the Lord commanded you? See, Deborah sends for Barak because it seems as if she knows already, and that Barak knows already, that God had commanded him to go up and fight against Jabin, to fight against Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, this wicked king who's now ruling over God's people because they're again in the midst of that cycle after Othniel and after Ehud and after Shamgar die. The people again are worshiping this the god of this this people group, Canaan, uh, these false gods. And, and hasn't the Lord commanded you, Barak, to go and fight against them? Barak seems to have, seems like Barak should already know. What's interesting, too, is just the way that the the command there is so specific. It's It's got to be that God has given a word already to, to Barak to do this. I mean, Deborah expects Barak to know that God was going to give him, give over this army to him by the river Kishon, like very specific. So this is something that Barak should have known he should have done, and he didn't do it. And this dynamic of his indecisiveness and his unwillingness to go plays out further. Verse 8. So now he says to Deborah, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. He, he wouldn't go unless Deborah went with him, even though the Lord had clearly commanded him to go without Deborah. And so we're seeing this problem of failed male leadership play out. We're seeing it clearly in this text. And we get the clearest indication that that's what's going on in Deborah's word, in her response back to uh, Barak in verse 9. She says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, she's not saying that it won't lead to your glory because all glory belongs to the Lord, which it does. But this is the kind of glory that that we might expect for Barak to receive because he is trusting in the Lord. Th that's the kind of glory that, that will be foregone because of how he is going about obeying the Lord, if we want to put it that way. Uh, he will receive no glory. The Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, that's, in biblical terms, that's a slight uh, we have to we have to call it what it is. As much as male leadership and female leadership is a topic of discussion in today's culture, uh, what she's saying to him is uh, <laughs> it's a it's a judgment. It's a statement against uh, Barak, which suggests that because he's unwilling to do what the Lord's called him to do, a woman is going to get the glory. A woman is going to be the one who gets the praise. And, and that's a slight against Barak. That's, that's the result of Barak's sin, of his unwillingness to, to go and do what the Lord has commanded him to do. We have to, we have to acknowledge that. This is, this is the dynamic of Adam in the garden failing to lead and love his wife and protect her from the wiles of Satan. We're seeing that, in in a way, play out in today's passage. And now, interestingly, we get this uh, comment in verse 11 that Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. Now, in Exodus, Hobab, as he's described here, is also known as Jethro. But Jethro is an honorable man. Uh, he supports Moses. He cares about the people of Israel. He wants to help influence Moses for the best. Uh, in chapter 18 of Exodus, that's what he does. And here we find that this man Heber the Kenite, who the Kenites are the people of Hobab, the people of Jethro, the people of Moses' father-in-law, Heber is separating from them and going to live amongst these people in the land of Canaan. And we learn in verse 17, the second half of verse 17, that there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, this wicked king, 
and the house of Heber the Kenite. So Heber the Kenite, who should be a good guy, we might say, in the vein of Jethro or Hobab, his ancestor, has now kind of joined forces with the king of Canaan. And so we don't only get Deborah as this noble woman uh, who is doing what Barak is unwilling to do himself, though the Lord has called him to do it himself. We also see the wife of uh, the wife of this man Heber doing what her husband probably should have been doing himself. Right? We see her in her own tent, and we see this uh, uh, amazing passage play out where she takes a tent peg and drives it into the skull of Sisera, who's the commander of the army of Jabin, the king of Canaan, and kills him. Heber doesn't do that. Heber's wife, Jael, does that. Barak doesn't do that. A woman, Jael, does that work of crushing the head of of Sisera by smashing a tent peg through him and driving it into the ground. This is not this is not a passage uh, for political correctness on, on numerous fronts, uh, but I hope you're seeing that this is what the scriptures are teaching us, that the woman did the job of the man because the man wasn't willing to do it. And so the passage isn't prescriptive. It's not saying that this is how women should behave, that they should take tent pegs and fight off God's enemies by driving Ten pegs into the, it's not a prescription for a specific way to respond to wickedness around us. It's it's laying out principles for us, and it's helping us to see that in the process of God's people living without a king in the land, we're seeing judges that He's providing for them that are increasingly becoming uncomfortable with the Lord's calling in their lives, and. That's a word for us to to keep in mind because God calls us, especially the men among us, to lead God's people, to lead our families. Are we doing it? Are we are we following God's call on our lives? You know, for myself, I very clearly see how just yesterday I failed to to do what God had called me to do. He called me to lead my family by, at least I have a conviction that he's called me to lead my family by feeding them the word, at least for a few minutes each day by reading scripture with them, calling them together and reading scripture with them. And I usually do that over dinner time, if, if not in our living room, kind of in a, in a more focused way. At least we do that over dinner time. I'll read a few verses to them. Right now we're going through Isaiah. And yesterday I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to eat dinner. And, and that's what I did. And um, it led to my wife later on in the evening reading scripture to my children because I didn't. And I, I, really, I really wasn't planning to. And I'm thankful that my wife did that. But it was really my job to do that work. And um, I read this passage of scripture today and I, I realized, wow, I've, I've got I've to take responsibility for what I've done wrong. But brothers and sisters, it's only because this passage points forward to one who did the job that all of us men and even all of us women have failed to do that I could bring my failures to the Lord and be forgiven and be restored. Because you see, Sisera is killed by Jael, who drives a tent peg into his skull. Sisera represents evil in this passage. He's the commander of the evil army. And he has his head crushed by this woman. And if we recall from Genesis chapter 3, what we referenced earlier, in that passage of Scripture, there's a prophecy that one day an offspring would come, a male offspring. He, as the text refers to him in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, 15 or 16, I can't recall at the moment. He will bruise the head of the serpent. He will bruise the evil one's head. He will crush, as an alternative translation says, the head of the serpent. A man would come one day to crush the head of not just Sisera, but the true enemy of God's people, Satan. And brothers and sisters, Jesus is the one who did that. Jesus came to crush the head of the true enemy of God's people. And he, just, he didn't just come to do it. He actually did it. He actually came to do it. It's, it's past tense. It's been done. 
And because of that, we can come to God in repentance for our failed leadership, for our failed obedience to him, whether you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. You can bring your failures to Jesus because he didn't fail where we have. He succeeded where we neglected our call to follow after the Lord. It's because the Lord is the one who saves his people. He subdued, as it says in verse 23, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. He'll subdue our laziness and our failures and our fears. He'll subdue our enemies, the enemies of God's people. He'll subdue them through his son Jesus. May we follow after him today. Take up our crosses after our Lord Jesus who died to save us. That's how Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. His heel was bruised, but he crushed the head of the serpent. And because he did, and because he gives us his spirit, we can take up his calling in our lives to follow after him and to put to death our fears of trusting the Lord. Let's ask God's help to do that today. Please pray with me. Father, we are humbled by this word. We need your grace. You've provided your grace in Jesus, the true crusher of the serpent's head. Without him, we are hopeless. Lord, we thank you for the picture that you have given us in this passage of Jesus, Lord, for the, for the, the type that JL provides, Lord. We thank you for the women uh, who you have used, Lord, to do the job that you've called men to do when men won't do the job. But we pray, Lord, that all of us listening that are men, that that wouldn't be us any longer, Lord, that we would take up the calling that you've given us to lead and to love and to serve, to lay down our lives, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, for our brides, for our wives, to, to lay down our lives in service to them, to lay down our lives for our sisters in the faith, to lay down our, wi- our lives even for the, for the women in the culture that don't know you, Lord, to serve. May the men do that. May we do that through the Spirit's strength. And may the women serve the men by continually calling them back to what you have told us to do, what you have told Hold the men to do in your word. Please, Lord, that is, that is the kind of beautiful dynamic that you would have for your people. In contrast to what the culture tells us, to what the world tells us, to what they command us to do, we pray we would follow your command and give Jesus the glory who deserves it, who did what nobody else could and who did it perfectly. In his name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you will have been encouraged by Jesus, our true King, from today's passage of Scripture, and that you will follow after him wholeheartedly because of his love for us. God bless you.